You are listening to Wild About Arizona, the official podcast of the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Here's your host, Michael Coliani. Hey everyone, and thank you for joining us. So it's springtime, the short-lived springtime here in the state of Arizona, and that means that a lot of more animals will be coming out and interacting with humans as they're out enjoying themselves recreating, and that includes amphibians and snakes, reptiles, all sorts of creatures, and to talk to us a little bit more about that today is Tom Jones, the Amphibians and Reptiles Program Manager for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Thanks for joining us today, Tom. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Michael. So Tom, if you could, could we just start with what got you interested in amphibians and reptiles and brought you here uh, to Game and Fish? <laughs> the, the, uh, my road to Game and Fish is long and torturous, so I don't know if I can go <laughs> into that in, in too much detail. But uh, I've had a, um, an interest in amphibians and reptiles since I was a child. Um, I can remember when I was six years old growing up in New Jersey, finding salamanders under boards in our backyard um, and that was it. I was hooked. Um, so, uh, uh, I've always been the kind of kid to go out and grab whatever kind of snake or toad or turtle I could find and, and annoy my parents by bringing them <laughs> home. Um, and that just translated into college where I majored in, in biology and, uh, went on for graduate work. Um, I was a professor at Grand Canyon University for 11 years. Um, and here I am at Game and Fish, uh, doing what I love with amphibians and reptiles. And, and most importantly, um, trying to actually do conservation for amphibians and reptiles that are in need in our state. It's so wonderful to be a part of an organization where we see so many folks really getting to play out their passions, and that's that's certainly the case with with you as well. I think that yeah, I think that's correct for a lot of us here at Game and Fish. Yeah, regardless of creature, mm-hmm. somebody is here talking about it passionately. Yep. So speaking of which, Tom, do you think you could just tell us a little bit about the variety of snake species here in Arizona in particular, because we really do have a diverse group of of snakes. We do. We have. Uh, we are one of the more diverse states in the in the country for um, snake species. We have fifty seven species of native snake in Arizona. Um, so that's a pretty impressive number. Uh, many of those are secretive that folks will never see, uh, but a lot of them are are common and and visible in many parts of the state. Uh, and that 57 includes 13 species of rattlesnakes, more th- more rattlesnakes in Arizona than there are in any other state in the country. Wow. So, yeah, and rattlesnakes, not only visible, but you're going to hear them as well. So what makes rattlesnakes in particular such a unique creature that, you know, we really uh, should have a lot of, of pride for here in Arizona? Rattlesnakes are incredibly unique. Uh, they They belong to a group of snakes called pit vipers. So first of all, I think one of the most unique characteristics of pit vipers is that they have what is called a thermally sensitive pit in the front of their face that uh, uh, kind of orients out almost like their eyes would facing outward. And they use that to detect prey and to detect uh, potential predators that are warm blooded. Uh, They're, like I said, they're thermally sensitive. So they're they're capable of, of detecting very slight changes in temperature uh, even if they can't see their prey, they can detect them. They can essentially see them in the infrared through these pits. So that's one of the most unusual and uh, unique things about rattlesnakes. And then, of course, the rattle that makes them rattlesnakes. Um, the rattle, the rattle itself, is just a bunch of dead, um, shed skin. Basically, it's keratin, like your fingernails or your hair. Uh, and every time the rattlesnake sheds it adds a rattle to the end of its string of rattles. Um, a lot of folks think that you can, um, you can age a snake, age a rattlesnake by its rattles. You cannot uh, because they add a rattle every time they shed and they shed as often as they feed. Um, shedding is part of growing. Um, but the rattle itself is a, is a unique structure because it serves as a warning um, to potential predators that might attempt to harm the rattlesnake. It can uh, rattle that rattle uh, and alert the animal that's coming towards it that you don't want to mess with me. Um, And 
the reason you don't want to mess with me is the other unique part about rattlesnakes is that they are vipers. They have a unique hypodermic-like set of fangs that can inject venom into their prey or into their predators uh, if needed to defend themselves. But uh, the venom in rattlesnakes is designed to allow them to capture and subdue prey. And the fangs inject that venom into that, those prey items. But again, there's the secondary uh, purpose of, of venom and fangs, and that is for defense. The venom itself uh, is, in general, in rattlesnakes, it's, it, it's a chemical compound that breaks down um, tissues in their prey. So when a rattlesnake strikes a prey item like a mouse, that, that mouse is already being digested by the venom that the rattlesnake has uh, injected into it. Um, so that gets the digestion process beginning, uh, in addition to, of course, subduing and killing the mouse. Gosh, I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing, Tom, but you've made me fear rattlesnakes maybe just a little bit more hearing <laughs> about that kind of thing. But really, when they're rattling at something, they're just as f- afraid of us as we are of them, right? Absolutely, and there, and there really is no reason to fear them. Uh, you know, a lot of people have fear of snakes in general and then a, a fear of rattlesnakes in particular. Uh, rattlesnakes have no desire to mess with humans. They are, as you said, more afraid of us than we are of them. Uh, to them, we're giants. We're, we're predators that could kill them in an instant. And they want to let us know not to mess with them. Um, and they do the same thing for a, a bear or a, a bobcat or fox or anything else that might be trying to eat them. But uh, they are more afraid of us than, well, maybe not entirely more afraid of us <laughs> than we are of them. But... Uh, most rattlesnakes actually won't rattle to warn somebody something. What they want to do is stay quiet and stay in the background. Um, because once you start interacting with a potential predator, you put yourself in possible danger. So the best thing for a rattlesnake to do, and what most of them do, is they remain quiet where they are and let the potential predator, humans, mm-hmm. go by. So for the most part, when we're out hiking, enjoying ourselves outside, there could be rattlesnakes right off the trail watching us before we even see them. Undoubtedly, there are, Um, especially especially in um, places where rattlesnakes are abundant in general, such as the desert, um, some of the middle elevation areas. Sure. Um, Yeah, I I would say um, unequivocally that uh, anybody who has hiked desert trails in Arizona has probably passed a rattlesnake unknowingly because it kept quiet. And I'm sure that's fine for most people to keep things that way. Yes, I'm sure mm-hmm. it is. Well, since it is springtime, you know, and in particular April and May is sort of a high time for a rattlesnake activity. We get a lot of reports of, of folks kind of stumbling across them. Does this have to do with our warmer temperatures or what is it about this time of year where we see a lot of uh, snakes and other, other animals kind of making their way out and interacting with humans? Yeah, it's mostly warming temperatures. Uh, so rattlesnakes over winter in dens or burrows or something to get away from the cold. And as it warms up in the spring, uh, in the desert, it might be in in February or March. Uh, At higher elevations, it might be March, April, or even May in some places. Uh, As they warm up, they come out of their overwintering sites, um, and they tend to hang around those overwintering sites for a while as they warm up. And as it gets even warmer, then they start moving because there is the drive to to obtain prey, um, as well as a reproductive drive. That is, they're going to start looking for mates. So uh, rattlesnakes and other snakes are going to be on the move as the temperatures warm up. And here in the, in the Phoenix general vicinity, it might be March, April. Um, you get up a little bit higher, say in, in Cave Creek, it might be April, May, um, and, and so forth as you go higher in elevation. Sure. I think the the only snake encounter that I've really come across was actually in May of last year, about halfway up Mount Lemmon, uh-huh. where it felt like, you know, those temperatures were starting to warm up. Wasn't quite, you know, in the 90s yet, yeah. but it was about that time when you're going to see rattlesnakes and other things like that. Right. right. Yep. You can't predict exactly when they're going to come out, but but early spring is a good time for them to start moving. They also move quite a bit during the monsoon. Um, 
really tell. So how do, how does the monsoon affect their 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 behavior? Well, in in large part, it's the moisture. Um, they are able to move around because there is water available. Every animal needs water, so uh, it's not only the the ability of the rattlesnakes or other snakes to move during the monsoon because of water, but their prey are also moving uh, mm. because water is available. And uh, temperatures are a little bit lower at night during the monsoon, uh, so it makes it more conducive to animals moving around. Okay. Well, if you, I think we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty here, Tom. Okay. If you come across a rattlesnake, whether that be out on a trail in nature or even in front of your doorstep when you come home from work, what are some steps that you advise people take? Okay. You're not talking about me in particular now, are you? Because (laughs) I might do things differently. Sure. Yeah. So the, the general advice for anybody who encounters a rattlesnake is just to leave it alone. Um, the worst thing that you can do is mess with it, uh, try to move it or um, scare it away because all that's going to do is anger the snake um, Mm -hmm. or frighten the snake to the point that it's going to defend itself. What you should do when encountering a rattlesnake or any other snake that you're unfamiliar with is stop, breathe a little bit, and then give the snake a wide berth. Um, You don't have to turn and run away. It's not going to chase you. Um, You don't have to walk 50 feet in one direction to get around it. Uh, A snake, a rattlesnake can only strike about three quarters of the the length of its body. Mm -hmm. And most of the rattlesnakes are under four feet in Arizona. So give them a 10-foot berth and walk around them and you're perfectly safe. The same would be true if you discovered one at home. But then there are other issues, of course, pets, uh, children, safety around the house. And for that, I would recommend that uh, the person that discovers a snake like that around their house probably call one of the uh, the private businesses that specialize in snake removal. Mm-hmm. And there are many of them in the metropolitan areas in Tucson and, and in Phoenix. What a, so you actually mentioned a little bit of something about my next question already. You know, not your family, your pets – are also going to be at home if they inter- if they interact with uh, with rattlesnakes. There's there's obviously different issues there involved. My family in particular has our own rattlesnake uh, versus pets story. Uh, my mother has two dogs. One went out in our front front yard area, got bit. The second one ran over to see what was going on, got bit as well. Both on the oh, face. Gosh, uh, pretty traumatic experience. Yeah. but fortunately, both of them are large dogs. They both survived. Good. Uh, but it's definitely a little bit of a different issue when you have mm-hmm. animals of your own. Yeah, and you, as you just pointed out, uh, there is often it is often the case that you can do nothing about it because the animal dashes out. They see the rattlesnake before you do, um, and you have a, a bad encounter like that. Um, mostly, it's keeping control of your animals if you know that there's a rattlesnake around. But there is an alternative. Um, there are there are a number of private concerns that will train your rattle your train your rattlesnake will train your pet your dog to avoid rattlesnakes uh, and some of those trainings are are quite effective. Uh, we had a couple of our dogs several years ago trained by one of these experts, um, and they wouldn't go close to a rattlesnake even a year later. So um, if you're a person that hikes a lot with your dog. Uh, or you do a lot of outdoor activities with your dog, you go camping, uh, that's not a bad idea to have them snake trained. Definitely value some valuable experience for both the human and the dog, I'd yeah. assume. Well, the dogs can detect the snakes long before we can. They detect them by smell, uh, whereas we can't do that. And that's one of the things that these, uh, these really good um, trainers do is they train the, the dogs on smell of rattlesnakes, not just hearing them or seeing them. So I understand that the Game and Fish Department is involved in a number of conservation projects uh, involving snakes, not just rattlesnakes, but the other species as well. You said, what was it, 59? 57. 57, excuse me. Species. uh, Number of species. And so just tell us a little bit about, if you can, some of the projects that Game and Fish is involved with uh, to help conserve these species. Well, in Arizona, we have two garter snakes. that are listed under the the uh, Federal Endangered Species Act. Uh, they're both listed as threatened because they've suffered declines throughout their distributions. Um, and we are 
participating with a number of partners, including the Fish and Wildlife Service, University of Arizona, um, Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, and others, to um, uh, and the Phoenix Zoo, to conserve these snakes. So the two snakes that I'm talking about are the narrow-headed garter snake that occurs in streams that, that um, come off of the Mogollon Rim all the way across the state from, uh, from Oak Creek on up into the White Mountains. And then the, the Mexican garter snake, which is a snake of, of marshes and wetlands uh, and lake sides that occurs throughout much of southern Arizona or occurred through much of southern Arizona. So right now, although we are not directing um, projects or we're not actively doing projects ourselves, we are working with the University of Arizona uh, and other partners to um, study both of these snakes to determine what kinds of conservation actions are working best for them and that will help them recover so that we can take them off the endangered species list. Sure. Tom, Tom, if you could, you know, that just kind of got me thinking. After you've been involved in this kind of research for a long time now, what are just, what's the feeling like when you're, when you're out and, and you realize that the research and the, the methods you guys are using are, are really making a big impact on, on these species and, and conserving them? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because the, the feeling is, uh, is really one of satisfaction. Um, and it's mixed, I, I should say. There's satisfaction when you see these things work. Um, but mixed emotions because you know that it takes a lot of work to get those things to work and that that's one small piece of the puzzle. Um, recovery for any species is a very complex uh, process. So when we see any of these successes, we're excited. And I'll give you one example. Um, the Phoenix Zoo has been raising uh, narrow-headed garter snakes for many years for us. They're experts in producing these in captivity. And we've been working with the University of Arizona, uh, a professor at the Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit and one of his graduate students um, to study these snakes up on the rim in northern Arizona. And uh, he, the student has released some of these snakes that the zoo has produced. And they have survived up to one to two years later. That may not sound particularly remarkable, but it's unprecedented that you can mm -hmm. take a snake that was raised in captivity, release it into the wild, and expect it to survive for another year or more. Um, that gives us a tool for recovery that we can use to reintroduce snakes to places where they no longer occur or their populations have declined if we are able to mitigate some of the threats to them. Um, and that's the kind of success that really, really gets us excited. Sure. Such encouraging news. Yeah. Is there something about, is, is there something about reptiles or snakes in general that allows us to, to do things like that, you know, breed them in captivity and then take them out into the wild? Because there are, of course, situations with other types of animals that once they're in captivity, they really can't, you know, afford to, to be out in the wild. Well, the department's engaged in a number of efforts like this. Uh, we do it with, with black-footed ferrets also, raise mm -hmm. them in captivity and uh, release them into the wild. So these kinds of things are done. Um, the thing about snakes is that uh, they don't necessarily produce a whole lot of young at a time. A, a big Mexican garter snake will produce about 30 young at a time, and that's a lot. Um, but you have to have a lot in captivity to produce a lot of offspring so you can release those because you, you, sus you expect that when you release animals into the wild, a very high percentage of them aren't going to make it for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. They're naive animals that you're putting out in the landscape that they've never experienced right. before. Um, so you want to have large numbers. Now, where this does work a lot in my program, the amphibians and reptiles program, is with frogs. We also work with federally listed Chiricahua leopard frogs. We work with SGCN, that species of greatest conservation need, um, northern leopard frogs, uh, and relic leopard frogs. And we raise all of those in captivity. And, and we release tadpoles, we release frogs, and we often release egg masses. And we release egg masses because they contain anywhere from 500 to 1,000 eggs. So you're up in your chances right there by increasing the sample size that you're putting out onto the landscape when you release an egg or you translocate an egg mass. And those are very successful programs. 
So speaking of, of other reptiles, snakes, things like that, what are you know, so, some other creatures, I guess you could say, that you feel like folks should be aware of if they're out recreating, if they're out hiking? Well, let's see. Um, I think two of the most iconic reptiles that, that people are familiar with, at least from pictures and books, are Gila monsters and desert tortoises. Um, both of those animals are quite common throughout the deserts and uh, for at least Gila monsters in the middle elevations in southern Arizona, um, but seldom seen because sure. they're largely secretive. Mm-hmm. But um, those are the kinds of things that folks should watch for because there's, I don't think there's any greater thrill than seeing a Gila monster cross your path. And there is a, a venomous reptile that is, at least as far as humans concerned, absolutely no issue. They are right. not aggressive. They they don't uh, leap at you to, to bite you. They run away first thing. Uh, they don't hold their ground. They're, they're basically harmless unless you try to grab one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you're going to regret it. But... Um, it is a thrill to see them. Uh, this bright pink or orange and black animal uh, that just stands out like a sore thumb, and you wonder why you haven't seen a hundred of them before that. Uh, and then desert tortoises, that iconic um, tortoise of the Sonoran Desert, uh, is just a remarkable animal that mm-hmm. is, again, a thrill to see because you don't often get the opportunity. Absolutely. I, I know it, w- it was one of the most ex- exciting moments for me when I was out exploring Aravipa Canyon mm-hmm. and got to see a wild Gila monster for the very first time. Very, very yeah. exciting moment. Yeah, I just got a, a photo the other day from a friend who saw a Gila monster and he was so excited about it. Yeah, oh. they're great. And then, of course, there are all kinds of other snakes that abound in Arizona. Uh, people often encounter king snakes or gopher snakes quite commonly completely harmless. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, just a thrill to see. Um, Like any other wildlife, uh, I think folks should take advantage of the opportunity that we have here in Arizona to see this kind of wildlife that is not as common in other parts of of the United States. All right. We have such a unique landscape here, unique biodiversity. We do. And just, I guess when folks are out and they're, they're enjoying themselves, it, it, one of the messages we always just want to give people is stay, you know, keep your distance, mm-hmm. enjoy them from afar, right? Correct. Yes. There's no need to try and capture an animal. It's a lot more fun to just watch it doing its thing. Right. L- let it live its life, venomous yes. or not. Keep Absolutely. your distance. Keep your distance. Yep. Well, Tom, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you uh, today, and we look forward to, to hearing more. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me, Michael. Thanks for listening. Visit us online at www.azgfd.gov.